it because you look so lovely, but you have a big brain. So, t TD and City asked what you wanted to see on City Line today. And we heard you this week you wanted to see questions you want to ask your gynecologist but we're afraid to ask. We get it. We're going to answer them here, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Because we don't mind going there. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bunch of questions, uh, and you've got all the answers. I've been finding intercourse painful lately. That's the first one. What could be the reason? Okay, so we get this question a lot as gynecologists. And it's our job to be good historians because okay. there are a lot of reasons why sex can be painful. Yeah. And we can't assume as physicians that sex is sex is sex or that people's sexual orientation is X, Y, or Z mm. or that intercourse means one thing. So we have to get people to specify what it is. But generally speaking, it can be either deep pain, which we qualify as something called dyspareunia, so okay. that's deep intercourse pain. Yeah. There can be something called, and it's a strange word, vaginismus. Okay. So that's involuntary contraction of the outer third muscles of the vagina. So that's initially on penetration, can be really painful and then sex can't happen. Mm -hmm. And then there's just genital pain without intercourse, without penetration. All right. So it's really important for the physician to ask all of the questions to figure out exactly what the problem is. This question, this painful intercourse also can be from the first time anyone's ever had sex or it used to be fine, and now secondarily it's painful. So that way it helps the physician to try and figure out what's going on. So expect to go in and be asked these questions oh. and be able to answer these questions and sort of pinpoint what's happening. Who knew all these things had names? They all have names. They all have names. And there's subcategories within each of those things. So if you think about this question and deep pain, so not intercourse initially, it starts okay and then, whoa, this is not good anymore. Yeah. That can be heralding something else going on in the pelvis. Right. And this can happen at any point in someone's reproductive lifespan. So I've had postmenopausal women, you know, coming to me from the seniors home for a, a consult and then well, by the way, I've noticed that now sex hurts. Mm -hmm. And so you can't assume because of somebody's age or because of the way they come in that they're not having sex frequently or enjoyably and that they should not be having enjoyable sex. So deep se pain can be from endometriosis, which we've talked about. Yes. So that's endometrial glands and stroma, which go elsewhere in the pelvis, mm -hmm. and that can be exacerbated, but that's usually pre-menopausally. Okay. Post-menopausally, we've talked about menopause. When estrogen goes away, estrogen is like the plump collagen for the vagina. So the vagina becomes atrophic and it thins out mm -hmm. and it becomes what we call friable and so people can even bleed during intercourse, especially with the advent of Viagra. I mean, men have to have erections for you know, penetration to happen, but with Viagra, it's a free-for-all and now 70-year-olds <laughs> even, right? So the, we have newer problems coming up yeah. at different stages. So we really have to be able to ask the question specifically. It could be fibroids, it could be atrophy, or then it can be something else. If someone has had a history of sexual abuse at some point mm -hmm. and they haven't been willing to talk about it, but they talk about it indirectly about the problems of that intercourse, and then you elucidate that information, then you have a responsibility as a physician to send them off to the proper person for counseling and then throw in, so. God. Got it. Okay, so there's a lot of answers a to this question. To this you question. really have to go in and do it. your little, exactly. do you know, a diagnosis. So and it's what have important you. to be able to talk about the specifics of what your problem is, yeah. and then your physician try to get to the bottom of it. Okay, here's another one. Will my belly button go back in after I give birth? <laughs> what do you think? Does it go um, back in? Mostly. Mostly. So the belly button is the leftover scar from where the umbilical cord fell off. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you tie it off and then there's that little stump and then you watch it fall off and you wait to see what happens on your baby. Well, then yeah. we have that umbilical, umbilicus for the rest of our life for the belly button. Yeah. When we are pregnant, by 20 weeks, the top of the uterus hits the belly button. And then beyond that, at the end of the second trimester, weeks 24 to 28, is where the uterus really gets big. Mm -hmm. And then the belly button has enough intra-abdominal pressure and the abdominal wall is descend enough that it pokes out. Mm -hmm. And then it gets bigger and bigger until you deliver. And then when the uterus involutes or contracts back down, then you have this leftover thing. Little stub. Sometimes it goes back in and it looks just fine. But mm -hmm. generally it looks, if you've had an innie, it goes back to be an innie, but it looks like a, you know, like a pair of jeans well worn in? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like stretched yeah. a little bit. It's so a little stretched. It doesn't quite look it as It winks at innie. you a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of like... You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, it's I not get quite it. the any. If you had an Audi, it kind of stays an Audi, but if you had an any, it can be a modified any. It's a modified any. <laughs> I love it. I want the question when will my belly go back in after I get Ah, uh, that's variable. You know. That's a whole other that's story. That's a whole other story. Okay, I'm six months pregnant and I have developed a strange line down my stomach. I know all about that. Will it go away? Yes. 
What is so, that line all so about? So originally, anyway? it's the linea alba. So yeah. how we form embryologically is that we our skin wraps around and fuses along the midline, and that's called the linea alba. It's usually white or fair. Yeah. Right. So when we get pregnant, we have hormones that come from all different places, and we're not clear if it's the estrogen and progesterone that stimulates these melanocytes through melanocyte stimulating hormone, okay. or if it's really when melanocyte stimulating hormone from the placenta picks up and then it gets darker. Long and the short of it is yes, you get this long dark line, but not only do you get that, everything that you have in your epidermis gets darker too that has melanocytes yeah. on it. So the areola or the nipples, they get really, they get large oh, and they yeah. get really dark. Huge. And then you also have other- I'm talking like a, like a coaster size. <laughs> It's no, actually almost no, frightening. No, 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 she's serious. I'm serious. But so the baby has like a target, right? Do, 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 exactly. do, 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 no, but really. Do, do, do. No, so you're right. Yeah. So the line is supposed Big. to be, so if the, if the baby uh, comes out and you enough. do not guide the baby, babies see the difference between dark and light. Mm -hmm. So we think that hypothetically this dark line would be the line for the baby to follow and then land on the bullseye mm. with a very large bullseye. So after pregnancy, when melanocyte stimulating hormone decreases back to normal levels, it goes away. So it, fa it fades out again. So it becomes a linear. Yeah, I gotta again. check and see if mine's still there or not. Is it gone? <laughs> it's supposed to go away? That's between you and your belly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll take a peek during the commercial break. break. Yeah, Do I have time for another one, JC? Okay, I'm worried about stretch marks. Uh, is there oh. anything I can do? Yeah, so stretch marks are those interesting lines that happen because the tensile stretch in your abdomen is variable depending on the person. Mm -hmm. And some people do well and don't get them, so I, w I knew that it's very genetic. So I looked all over my mother before yeah. I had babies. I was like, <laughs> turn around. Okay. So the common places for it is on your belly, on your breasts, you can have it on your buttocks, on your thighs, sometimes even on your lower back when you stretch oh, out. Oh, really, yeah. And Really, you can rub all the lotions you want. They've done randomized trials looking at certain things. Vitamin E might help a little, but generally speaking, rub all you want. It will be what it will be. Mm. So they're you're gonna get them. If you're gonna get them, you're gonna get them. You gotta love it. So you just yeah. rub yourself anyway. It feels good. Mm -hmm. Use the stuff. It makes you feel like you're, you know, you're like a well-oiled piece of leather. It's good. I agree. Right? But yeah. hopefully, with the studies that are coming out now, we'll find something that's a little bit more definitive. But they fade out after pregnancy. So they do. They it, originally they're kind of pink purplish or dark mm -hmm. on darker skin people they're mm -hmm. more common on darker skin people so oh. you know we're doomed by our genetics too Great, perfect. yeah whatever That's but awesome. um, if you get them you get them <laughs> love them embrace them you can't do anything about them yeah whatever it's your body it's okay yeah. love it and remember to visit cityline.ca for your chance to win with TD break time stay with us good answers Marjorie good